Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show usually, normally, live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's okay. We do um, record the show and then it is posted to our um, in our archives for you to watch later at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives. Both of the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, <laughs> anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Um, for those of you not from uh, Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here, so similar to your state library. So we provide services and training and resources to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, historical societies, on and on and on. Really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes come on and do presentations um, for um, things for everybody or things that are Nebraska specific, um, but we also bring in guest speakers. And that's what we have today, sort of a mixture, mainly a guest speaker, <laughs> a guest speaker with a guest. <laughs> um, but uh, Brian is here. He's been on the show oh, a few times before over the years uh, to talk about um, lots of techie related things. And he, I'm going to let you do a full, more full in, introduction of yourself, but he's going to talk to us. We, we reached out to him to talk about AI, things that are going on in that kind of world, artificial, intel, artificial intelligence, chat, GPT, possibly things like that, that people are like, I don't know what's going on. Um, but he's going to try and, you know, hopefully make us feel better about it, despite the title of his... <laughs> <laughs> the modern day Pandora's box. So I hand it over to you, Brian, to go ahead and awesome. and also with us um, joining us today to chime in too is Amanda Sweet, who's our technology innovation librarian here at the Library Commission. In case you're wondering who that other head is, so I'll just hand it over to you, Brian. Cool. All right. Well, then I will go ahead and get us started. And my quick my quick little intro is I'm Brian. I'm the director of strategic innovation here at the Evolve Project, uh, and I like finding new technologies and seeing what they do and implementing them in various organizations, usually in the uh, education space, so like libraries and schools. Uh, I've been playing with AI for, for a few years now, uh, and so this is very exciting that I no longer have to argue about the use of AI because everyone knows what it is. So this is, this is a less stressful conversation for me. Uh, and so without further ado, I will go ahead and get this rocking. So AI in the modern day Pandora's box. If you have questions throughout the event, definitely post them into the questions box. Uh, I'll try to answer them if I'm at the screen over here. So if you see me looking, that's why. Um, if you have your run into questions or you're like, what is he talking about? Or you want to argue or challenge, I encourage all of that because uh, mm -hmm. I don't like presenting straight. I like interruptions. So please interrupt if you do have comments. So I always start off with these types of slides when I talk about AI. What is actual artificial intelligence? Um, by definition, it's the theory of development of using computer systems to handle what humans typically perf uh, performed, uh, whether that be basic tasks, uh, visual understanding, speech recognition, making choices, or even having translations done between different languages. Uh, a lot of data, a lot of AI is based on data or using machine learning to make decisions. Uh, machining, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that mainly uses algorithms and statistical models to enable a computer system to make decisions based on the data that it has. Oh. Uh, and so I, I stole this lovely slide from Amanda, who's with us today. Uh, and she does a whole bunch of really great infographics, and they linked a, a source web page as well for you to kind of grab more of these. This is a really great document explaining the various facets of machine learning and how machine learning can build data, build content, and make decisions. Uh, it is hey. a really good infographic. Yes, thank you. And so. Uh, back in April, I was in Florida, and this is always, this is, I find this funny. Uh, and so I travel a lot with like a stack of iPads and a bunch of other things, and I do hands-on projects and demonstrations. 
uh, it's all my iPads are connected to the internet. And suddenly it's made like Twitter news. So it's legit. Uh, at what time was that? At 4.45 AM, all my devices in my hotel room in Florida went off at the exact same time with that like emergency sounding beacon. Oh, and I yeah. thought we were like in a war zone. I like could not understand what was going on. Uh, it's because all my devices got the emergency alert. And so, and then at that conference, I was talking about AI in, in the morning. So I was very tired. Uh, and I was like, yeah, if AI existed, we may have been able to avoid this, which was a simply just a AI doing a test, uh, or not a person doing yes, a test, yeah. testing the emergency system. And instead of sending it to the test users, they send it to everyone in the area. So usually when I talk about AI, I have these two types of people's reactions. So hopefully, you're not the one on the right, you're going to be the one on the left. So our topic for today is using AI as a tool, um, how people typically use AI in different industries, and we'll pull it all together and apply it specifically to the library world. So AI, in a, in a nutshell, comes in three main forms. You have your human-like interactions, whether that's agents, chatbots, robots, et cetera. Insight generation, so digesting a bunch of data and making a determination from that data. Or advanced automation, so making things happen automatically without having a user be intervened. And that would be like smart houses and stuff. Uh, the success of AI or a successful AI tool doesn't really come from a small group of people just like plugging away at a keyboard. It mostly comes from end users using it where they're providing it with information as feedback whether or not that information is correct. So if we're looking at AI as in four different components, we, use, we used to see AI mostly in logic, logic and base rules. So if something happened, this is a result. And an AI would, that was like very rudimentary AI. Uh, now we have what's called pattern-based or machine learning AI, where over time the AI gets better and better at what it does, whether that's creating content making or making decisions or looking at data. Deep learning takes that even farther, and it's a subset of machine learning where it lets computers make decisions on its own. So without human interaction, it's smart enough or has the algorithms in place where it knows what factual information and what isn't to make better decisions. And then neural networks is a fancy word to basically explain how uh, computers talk to each other, GPUs and things like that to make those decisions and provide output um, for that machine learning to learn from or get better at its function over time. So artificial intelligence definitely exists. It can do self-driving cars, do language translation. There's a company called Interpretify that you can have an AI join a, a Zoom meeting and it will do whatever languages you want and translate in real time. Uh, and so that's how far we've gotten now. Uh, so the idea of strong artificial intelligence doesn't fully exist yet. And that's the idea that computers can think at a level that, that passes people's abstract thinking. Computers can't necessarily abstract thought. You can't ask a AI to have its own feelings and emotions about content unless if you fed it very specific emotion and content, if that makes sense. If I wanted a computer to be sensitive to the needs of Brian's woes in life, it will do a great job. But if Amanda or Christina asked it to you know, be sensitive to their needs, it would be like, nope, Brian's needs are most important. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's still designed by, by data. Uh, feel free to steal these slides as well. The slides will be shared. when I teach like younger patrons how AI works, I like to show them this example. And this is called, the, I call it my flashlight example. When you want to build an AI with logic-based rules, the code, if you will, would be, if you see it dark, turn on the light. Machine learning takes that a little bit farther. And the code behind it is the flashlight would automatically turn on if it learns other words from, for dark. Um, so picking up words that contain the word dark and turning on the light. Deep learning takes it even farther and makes connections to when you need to turn on the light. For instance, if I say I can't see in this room, it may go, well, it maybe needs a flashlight and turn on the flashlight uh, on my, in my app. And so that's the best way to kind of explain the different levels of AI, in my opinion. So breaking things out farther, um, when we look at AI, uh, there's a various ways for it to learn. There's learning on experience. So the system learns positive and negative experiences as you give it the data it needs, it makes a decision from those experiences. You can also let it learn on by example. And so if you think about like Google spam filtering service that's built in, every time you detect something as spam, 
Google over time learns that, well, they flag all these things to spam. Here's the similarities between them. So now we know what spam looks like because you keep providing us that information. Uh, deep learning and self-learning are the more advanced side of, uh, of that family. Uh, self-learning takes advanced machine learning and makes the decisions by looking at its own data sets and, and drawing conclusions from that. And then deep learning uses a lot more complicated math models to combine, to create content or to create pictures or even develop speech. So the biggest problem in the world right now, and always has been, is garbage data in, garbage data out paradigm, which means you can build and invest the best AI component in the world, but if you give it bad data, you're gonna have bad results because the data is not good. Or if you have the best data in the world, but a really bad model, you're not gonna have a very good, good AI tool. So that's why finding the right AI tool is incredibly challenging because to get both of these things mastered perfectly is near impossible. <clears throat> Overall, from patterns to automation, the idea with AI is to use algorithms to sift through data. Uh, so when we talk about like ChatGPT or OpenAI, for example, excuse me, it learns from uh, data that people provide it uh, in order to make those decisions. But there's so much data going into it, uh, it has to take a step back and kind of digest it. Um, and so, AIs can also be transactional, so you get an answer, give it, give a question, get an answer, like a virtual assistant. And it can also be automated, so providing routine tasks that you know you don't really have to, like taking the track out every day. If you can build an AI to do that, that'd be amazing. So here's some very basic examples of what we see AI doing, followed by a very complex solution or a very complex um, concept. So AI can use what's called image recognition. And so it's how we see on our iPhones, for those that are Apple fanboys like me, it can detect everyone else's faces. It can notice the difference between a dog and a cat. And you can search in your photos for all your favorite furry friends just by typing in the word dog. Or you can type in a person's name and see all those photos of that individual on your phone. Um, Facebook got in trouble for doing that as well. So anytime you posted something on Facebook, it would see if your photo existed anywhere else. And, uh, I think I'll show you a really cool hack tool that's a little creepy, but also kind of neat, um, that uses people's images to find out if they exist anywhere else online. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, so image recognition. Well, we can take that even farther and use this as an augmented tool in the workforce. And so Microsoft Azure has a, a tool set called Cognitive Intelligence, where it can detect uh, or syntax or semantics or personality using AI. And so you can upload a photo and it can tell if that person is excited, angry, fearful, happy, neutral, etc. It's a really great way to find out if your significant other was excited to see you on your wedding day. Upload that photo and find out the real truth behind that marriage. That's a joke. Don't do that. You might not like the results. Um, but using these tools, you can also use those in the workforce. And so uh, the reason why you have Walmart greeters at every Walmart is it's a detractor for people that might want to do something bad like steal or, or hurt others. And so having like a, a virtual greeter greeting everyone, it can feed off of if this person is you know, in a good mood or not, and then make those determinations and security questions answered. We also see AI in voice recognition. Um, so you can see when you ask Siri, oops, ask Google Home, Echo, et cetera, questions, uh, you will get responses from that. Uh, and so, it's gotten so well that you can ask your, your Google Home, for instance, how do I get home versus somebody else asking how do I get home? And they'll have very tailored results based on those profiles that were designed based off their, their voice. So those are all the different things that you can see using with AI uh, in terms of an interaction standpoint. Uh, so then we also have a bunch of AI robots that have come out over the years. Samsung is probably the one that does like the most like creepy innovative things. Uh, they have, uh, robots that can pick up trash. Uh, they have robots that can serve you food and you push on the order and it goes beep beep and it goes into the kitchen and grabs the things that it needs. Um, we have robots that are for at home people that have like dementia Alzheimer's and provides that emergency assistance if need be. Uh, they even have robots that can do dishes for you and set tables. Uh, and so there's, there's a flavor for everything. Hmm. Um, so, 
If you just even go on Google and just search for robot assistance for home, you'll see a variety of products ranging from a couple hundred bucks to thousands of dollars that can follow you around. And finally, Brian has friends. So if you go to my house, there's like a thousand robots running around and they all love me and that's all I need. <laughs> So there's a lot of other forms of AI as well. So we have optical character recognition, so I can take a photo of text <laughs> and it can detect that text. That's how license plate readers work. There's not like some nerd sitting behind a screen looking at blurry photos of license plates. It's all driven by an AI component. Hmm. Advanced user preferences is another flavor of AI where uh, it looks at what your like buying habits, viewing habits, depending on Amazon or Netflix, and then compares that with other people doing the exact same thing as you and finds out what the differences are between the two. And that's how those recommendations take place. And then you have sensory data analysis. That's how your Apple Watch or your Fitbit knows the difference of you running or walking or swimming. And so when I go for a run, my watch is like, should we call 911 for you? You don't do this exercise ever. Is everything okay? That's a joke. Mine doesn't do that. Um, <laughs> and so, there's all these different forms of AI that have been developed over the years to make our lives simpler. And here's some humor, lighten up the mood. That's why you name all your robots. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so then we also see AI being used in our in different corporate environments um, where AI is either being asked questions in a, in a chat conversation to provide answers, like how do I set up an office reply? What's our Wi-Fi password? Where's the bathroom? Uh, or even on the more complex end. So I'm in way too many like different Teams chats for different organizations I work with and I cannot read all the messages all day long. So there's an AI I use called Spoke that will read everything throughout the day and then send me anything that I need to worry about as well as some like one or two bullet point summaries. And that's how I get through life. Um, so at this point, I always like to share, so whenever I talk about like tools and technology, I always like to see how other industries are using it and what works well and what doesn't work well. So healthcare, great industry to look at because they're very well funded. Uh, and so we can see what their success are with AI, what their failures are. We can also help make those decisions in terms of our organizations as education or libraries or community service. Excuse me. Sorry, I lost my voice over the weekend, oh. so I'm still recovering a little bit. I uh, went to an emo rave in a cave, so <laughs> screaming all day. Um, it's a good way to lose your voice. That'll do I it. Thought so. <laughs> I thought so. Fun way. And so, uh, and so this is uh, AI can be used to look at like MRIs or X-rays, and so it can take an image and figure out like if there is or something wrong to the scale of what a doctor can do. And now here's where it gets exciting. If we think about a company that builds an AI product for a hospital, and that hospital makes money based on doing surgeries, do you want the AI model to be very uh, strict in terms of, well, this might be something bad, so let's operate. Or do you want the AI model to be like, no, we've seen that a million times. It's rarely anything, I wouldn't worry about it. In my hospital design based on billables, which model would you pick? The first one or the second one? Most likely, a good business decision would be picking the first one, the one that's more, hey, this is this could be anything, we should operate right away, versus the model of, well, it's really anything. <laughs> and so this is a really good read in 2019, where someone researched a bunch of AI products that look at uh, that hospitals are using and whether or not it's a business decision to generate revenue or a business decision to find things that might be overlooked. Mm -hmm. So food for thought, Pandora's box has been opened. Uh, smart homes, uh, mm -hmm. we've been using, a lot of people have been using playing with smart homes for a while, whether that's your Amazons or your Alexas. And some of us like like nerdy people like me like go all out and have the blinds that open and close to see sun, Doors lock when you walk away. Looked all driven by AI automation. So I designed the rules in place, the logic based rules, and it makes the decisions as it goes. <laughs> so the uh, we also see AI being used in drones, self driving vehicles, uh, and even you know pretty soon 
or we're supposed to have self-driving cars at some point. I saw Back to the Future. We're we're at our mm -hmm. deadline. Um, so any <laughs> moment now, we're going to have those too. Uh, but we're seeing autonomous flying with drones, and people have been looking at using drones for delivery for, for a while now. But as AI is getting better, and the cost of using computing power has gone down, we're most likely going to start seeing that sooner. Because the reason why it was financially irresponsible was the cost of the machines to run the drones with the knowledge and the information was just way too expensive. Mm. Like you can you can overpay a truck driver and still save money. Like giving them six figures to drive a truck to your house and it was cheaper than doing the drone portion. I wonder if that would increase like delivery theft where you get like a little teenager that just tracks the drone and grabs them. Well, that's mm. why the little drops the little tasers on it too and chases people around. <laughs> I like it. Okay. <laughs> My world's a lot different than everyone else's, okay? <laughs> but that's a good question. Uh, People talk about convenience. But yeah, if there's no, how do they, yeah, security. Shooting the, shooting the drone down, it gets the package. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a lot of AI tools that exist for visually impairment. Um, so there's a company called Be My Eyes. There's a contact lens company uh, that you can put a contact lens in that will like read things out to you as you walk past it. Um, they won an award a few years ago. We have our digital assistants and there's other libraries that are using digital assistants like Alexis and Google Homes to provide quick answers like where's the bathroom? Because that's the number one question that every library gets is where's the bathroom? So having an AI provide those answers saves a lot of time and energy. So there's a lot of really cool, inspiring AIs. Uh, AlphaGo is a very there's a, there's a game called AlphaGo, and it's like one of the it's like super hard to play. There's like an infinite number of moves, and it takes hours to win. And so what AlphaGo did, uh, by based off of Google, is it watched a whole bunch of people play the game, and it figured out how to win the move in like or win the game in like ten moves. Uh, wow. And no one's ever been able to like do that. Don't quote me on the number. That's all I remember. Mm -hmm. That was pretty cool. Uh, and AI Ross is another great company. So for those that have heard about the chat GPT story of a law case, uh, so there was some airline dispute and the one lawyer used chat GPT to come up with a bunch of cases that he thought existed because chat GPT told him. Uh, and so it made up all these court cases for him. He went to the court and said, well, you can't do this because this court case said I can. And no one's heard of these. The judge haven't heard it. The defendants haven't heard of it. So they were like, well, let's research these. And it turns out, they never existed. So they asked the, the lawyer that presented them, and he's like, oh, yeah, he's chat GPT, though, so they have to be real. And so if he would have used this. That's not how that works. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I did hear about that story, yeah. And that's similar to, like, when students are using it to find citations for their research papers. It's not yep. real research. It's just going to make up that's things for you. Well, see, that's, in my day, we had Wikipedia. And I would just edit my Wikipedia article to prove my point. Mm -hmm. And uh, effective. Yeah, gotta make sure none of my professors around here because I don't want my grade to be reversed. But yeah, Wikipedia, <laughs> and you can edit that. You're never wrong. Um, the power of the internet. And so I digress. So AI Ross is a, is a uh, paralegal tool that has been fed specific court cases. So if you're working on a court document and you need to know if there's any court precedents, AI Ross is the tool for you. And just to show you the vast uh, diversity of different AI tools that are out there, every year towards the end of the year, uh, CB, or CB does a report of all the top like AI companies. Um, and so in 2022, these were the AI companies on the map and, and across various industries or different uh, product lines. And how many use ChatGPT to come up with their name? None of them, because no one used it yet until November of 2022. <laughs> But they will. So some fun runaway. I, I like runaway AIs or AIs that you know were fed guard bad data. And so these are really good proof points of what that looks like. So in 2016, uh, Microsoft released Tay, which was an artificial artificial chatterbot. And the goal was for Tay to have conversations with users on Twitter and have like this really cool like experience and interaction. But people on the internet like to ruin good things. And so they fed a whole bunch of like negative conversations to Tay and made Tay a very angry and aggressive, I think she was supposed to be a 19-year-old girl, made her a very angry and aggressive 19-year-old girl 
uh, and they had to shut it down because no one took the time to teach Tay what was considered good language and bad language. And so it's all about the data that you provide your, your model and that's what you get as a result. Uh, a funny one was inspirerobot.me and this one will create a random quote with a random image and the original design was to have photos match an image that made sense. Uh, but people like to ruin good things. Uh, so now you get like really random quotes and really random images that sometimes work, but usually in a funny way. Uh, and so this was like, considered a happy accident to me. All right. So if for those that are on speakerphone, I got in trouble for this at a conference because it actually had someone call 911. So the context for AI has struggled with context. So way back when, if you said the S word to your, your, your Apple phone, and said, call me an ambulance, it would then go, oh, let me call 911 for you. And it would actually dial out 911, or sorry, it wouldn't dial 911. It would say, hey, I will now call you ambulance because it didn't know the context. So if you asked for an emergency help, and you said, hey, Siri, call me an ambulance. It thought that, oh, you mean, it thought, oh, shoot, let me, let me rename your name. You're no longer Brian. Hey, ambulance, how are you? <laughs> so since it didn't know the context, it had to, be corrected. So now if, I think if you say, um, can you call me an ambulance? It will ask if you need emergency help and then call 911. Or you can also say, which I found out was, hey Siri, and say call 911, it'll actually do that. Uh, so I was at a conference in New York and suddenly like my phone's ringing, someone else's phone's ringing and it dialed out. And so that was uh, humorous to me, less fun for everyone else. Um, <laughs> So that's one of the challenges is AI sometimes struggles with context. There's also the precision component. Um, so when we talk about chat TPT, for instance, there's uh, it's precision, they call it temperature. So you can tell AI, the AI to be, make things up as it goes, be creative, only be very, very specific with the specific knowledge it has. Um, and again, you can still flood things with bad data and make bad decisions. So precision is another challenge with AI. And the third challenge is how do you train an AI model over time? Um, there is not a, no matter what the sales people tell you, there is not a single turnkey solution with AI. You always will have to train the model. Um, so if you're running a call center or if you're running a help desk, if you're running a, like how to do something cool on, on YouTube, uh, description and people are feeding content to it and asking questions, it still requires you to see if those questions that were asked had the right answers associated. Well, there's this constant circle of training, making sure the precision is accurate and it's understanding context. If you don't monitor those three components, your your AI will drift away. You know, just like humans learn too, better information, better decisions, and you can train yeah. people with bad data and get a horrible human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. that's how I was born. I'm just kidding. I'm not that bad. <laughs> um, and so another funny, funny little joke. And so there's even books that were written entirely by, by, by AI. So if you're having a rough sleep and you can't fall asleep and you're like, what can I do other than listen to Brian ramble on for an hour? You can read this book and it'll put you right to sleep. Uh, it's called Lithium Ion Batteries. And it was written entirely by an AI. Chapters and everything were organized by an AI. And this was done in, shoot, I wanna say like 2017. Um, so it's a really cool use case. But who gets paid it, from it? <laughs> the publisher they keep all the profits yeah um but it was more of designed to see what an ai can do if it was fed all this data uh, uh for me the way i like to learn is I like to take things apart and so if you go to experiments with google.com slash collection slash ai um you'll be presented with a bunch of ai activities that you can like edit and tweak and see what happens with it uh, there's a bunch of other like cute little games. You can go which face is real.com and it generates an AI image and finds a real image online and you have to choose which one's real or which one isn't. There's even AI models that allow you to draw a cat. So if you go to this website, you trace out like an image of a cat and it fills it in and gives this output. I caution you, if you have the inability to draw stick figures like myself and you try to draw a cat, you'll get something that's very nightmarish with like multiple heads and multiple tails and multiple arms. <laughs> um, so like, make sure you're good uh, before you start drawing because it, it's sometimes a little creepy. AI so we... images are always creepy. I think like 95% of the time, there's always something. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I'll show you a couple of AI created images of, of yours truly as well today. So how do we apply AI in education and library? Uh, the biggest piece is it offers an opportunity for lots of new skills. Uh, I put an asterisk on this. Uh, so if you teach everyone how to program, so way back when in the, the late 2000s, early, early 2010s, late 2000s, when there was that big push of let's get everyone to code. And Microsoft, Facebook, Google pushed that really, really hard. And the, re the socioeconomic reason for that is if you teach everyone how to code, guess how much you have to pay coders then? They no longer are $100 coders, they're $20 coders. So I always put a little asterisk that if you teach everyone how to do something, the cost of doing that, that, that task is lower. It's just the science behind why people promote things. Supply and demand. Um, yeah. And so, but if you wanted to learn AI, the tools to learn is the coding language is Python. Um, learn at a very basic level what the syntax is. It's very simple to follow. <laughs> uh, and it's most commonly used with most um, AI models. If you're looking at the math portion of it, um, you want to learn statistics. If you're looking at how computers see text, videos, and content, et cetera, or computer vision, that also uses Python. Uh, and if you're blending those components together, that would be your robotics and blending hardware and software making them work together. So well, how can we onboard AI today? The biggest win is having it used as a tool. So if you look at a reception standpoint and having an AI be a receptionist, you can detect emotions on people. You can find out what kind of help they need. It can answer all those very common questions that you get, like where's the bathroom? And then it would escalate those more complex and intimate conversations to a real human. Um, same with the chat, uh, chat bots. We see this more and more on, on different chat websites. When you go to chat in for support, usually you're usually working with a chat bot first. And most of the time, that chatbot can resolve your problem for you without going to a live agent. Then there's the other component. Uh, as people are investi investing money in um, autonomous driving, specifically in the shipping industry, which makes up one of the top five jobs in every blue collar city, <laughs> if that becomes all automated, what do you do with the, you displace a bunch of workers? So I always encourage people that are worried or thinking about that. <laughs> is having those people that do all the driving, do all the transportation, provide the correct data to the model in that way. Because again, as we talked earlier, that model requires constant precision, constant fine tuning, understand context and constant training. So if they get on that, that path sooner than later, they can be part of that movement, but also provide and have that, that job security. Uh, and the last piece with AI is how can we use it to make the world a better place? So what tools can we use and employ using AI? <laughs> people are doing that with smart cities, um, figuring out where like low traffic areas are, how to help promote businesses in low traffic areas, how to avoid traffic, doing emergency solutions. So if there hears like gunshot noise, it knows where in the city that gunshot noise is taking place to route traffic away from it so police can go. But there's a lot of really cool use cases in the smart city umbrella of AI. So I'm going to shift gears slightly and talk about like the products that exist that use AI to teach people artificial intelligence. Uh, my favorite is Zumi. So Zumi is this cute little low robotic car uh, that Amanda has a worksheet on, and I will show that worksheet at the very end. Uh, so Zumi is a self-driving car. You teach it how to drive. Um, so you do early coding, like following lines, following light, and then you get the more complex of avoiding obstacles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's Pi's plan for Pi's education. Uh, what they do is like Kai's bot and Kai's clan, which are also in Amanda's documentation, uh, that walks you through how to program a robot, to interact with other robots. You can code in a variety of different ways. You can even see the robots in the VR world too, and and, and provide code to it. If you like, learned a lot more about Kai's clan and Kai's education. Our Encompass Live two weeks ago was um, we had them on the show. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, this is called CodeDrone from the same company that uh, built Zoom, but for drones. And they're one of the only people that are approved for the aerial drone competitions. And so you can learn how drones can self-drive and be autonomous and avoid obstacles in a very easy to use coding interface. For a second, I thought you said the same company that built me. And I was like, I knew he was a robot. 
That would be a plot twist. Right. <laughs> I'm just faking the sore throat so I look more human. Ah, uh, you learned. They did a good job. Thank you. Thank you. I can learn more. Yeah. Um, this is Luca. Uh, Luca is able to read books in different languages and read it into whatever language you'd like it to read it in. You know, Luca is reading a Chinese book in this example, and it can read it in English, and you can show almost any book in this. There's like 75,000 books programmed in this library already. If there's a book that's not programmed in this library, you can teach Luca it by reading the book, and then you can turn pages, and it will read that page for you once it learns it, if it doesn't have it already. Let's see, super cute. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're looking at doing your own projects, um, this is a great do-it-yourself kit with Google and building like the Google Homes. Uh, this is a, a from Google called Dialogue Flow, and this helps you understand how machines understand what users are saying. So you can see those intents and use cases as you program your model and see where they fit. And this is what that console looks like. <laughs> so if there's uncertainty levels, it would be listed out, and you can then counter-correct it for future use of that model. Uh, so it's just fun to play with. I always tell people to play with things and see what happens. Uh, this is a uh, AI tool called the Lensa app. You can download it on your phone and you upload a couple photos of yourself and it will create like futuristic, like cool, edgy, steampunk photos. I did have a complaint when I made mine because all mine are sad and I uploaded photos of me being happy. So I don't know why. Every one of the photos I have looks like I've, I went through some stuff and I'm just <laughs> processing it. And so, don't know why. I'm usually pretty happy, so whatever. And there's other companies that have developed AI models that will take your photo and make them into business 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 photos. And so I should use that one. Uh, my hands look a little so AI struggles uh, with hands. Gonna say those uh, hands are not human. <laughs> I, mean, I have like an extra finger on one hand. I think that's it. Uh, <laughs> But most of them are in the pocket or something or, or off, off mm -hmm. something. Uh, fun fact, the reason why AMI, the AI models can do feet better than hands is because of Discord. Uh, because people wanted to see feet photos before hand photos, I guess. And you can draw yeah. your own conclusions. And so that's why the model, so again, the model is only as good as you train it. And so that's why it requires constant tuning. Um, the AI professional photo models have put me in the water and also made me a twin brother. Twins, yeah, look at that. <laughs> and so take this for what it's worth. My mom's not on here, so I can say this. I sent my mom a couple of these photos, and she's like, wow, where were you? These are really good. These are nice outfits. I go, did you find something that looks just like you? I'm like, <laughs> mom, they're not even me. Like, they kind of look like me, but they're barely me. Like the left one looks more like you than the right one in that last one. Like twin yeah, Brian, so. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then this one reminded me of the toy Santa from Santa Claus 2. Yes. I just look like that little robot Santa. I don't know, that's what I thought. So, and my mom thought that was me too. And I was like, wow, mom, you do not love your child. <laughs> uh, so how do we bring this all together? Uh, so usually the conversations that I hear is how does it impact staff and how do we improve it? Um, I always suggest that looking at AI is the shift of focus. So how can we make ourselves more efficient and more accurate? Um, and so we want to use AI to do those things, not necessarily always job displacement. A lot of it is using it as a tool. So like some of us use our phones for calculators and we don't want to do the math in our head. Think of that as the same component. Um, write that quick email because I don't have the time or send out a bunch of scheduled appointments because I don't have the time. Um, and so using AIs to make your workday more meaningful is, is the most important. Uh, they say that AI will struggle with empathy and emotional intelligence. And I would say that's no longer true. Because <laughs> um, AI can make a decision. AI is typically designed to make a decision based on facts and not account for emotional variables. But you could program an AI to understand those emotional variables. <laughs> I think audio might be a little off. I muted because I was gagging, and so I just got to unmute. That's fair. So this is Maslow with, without the W. I misspelled it. Uh, and so what Maslow did was they had a whole bunch of people, me included, uh, journal our day every day for like a month. 
and we use colors and like random words to describe what's going on, recorded ourselves. And so it was one of the first AI companies that used emotional intelligence back in 2018, 2017. Um, and it's now designed as a coach. And so if you wanted to have like a professional coach, um, either you can have an AI drive it entirely or a coach would use this tool to give to their clients and they would get the summary of their days and figure out where their trends are. It's also been used for therapy and a few other components. Um, but that's Maslow. And some other fun tools to make your life better. Uh, I use MeetGeek for all my meetings. So MeetGeek joins every meeting I'm in, summarizes the conversations that I've had, and gives me bullet point list items of like what to do next uh, and what's going on and who owns what project uh, because I don't take notes when I talk. So this is MeetGeek. Poise is a very similar product that you can actually upload your, it takes your agenda in your calendar. And as you talk, it'll cross things off your agenda. So make sure you can have your agenda up on the side and it'll cross things off as you talk about it. And then it can even score that interaction. So let's say you were doing a job interview, you choose, this was for a job interview, and it will tell you if you had clear communication for the job, where you, where you yeaned or weaned, like we're unsure, if you were more sure, you may have a better chance of doing the job, tweak these, these phrases, uh, and it's a performance coach as well. So it makes sure you say, you'll say, um, like Brian does all the time. Or if you talk too fast, like Brian does all the time. Um, and so using all those little components, uh, you can learn how to better present and better speak, as well as having it as a meeting tool. Uh, there is a variety of AI content creation tools out there. This is there's writer to create text. There's pictorial to create videos. I was just playing with that. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Uh, there's smart writer that can generate landing pages for you that can help you write um, business ideas. You can give it some, some bullet points. It helps you write a business name or a business plan. There's crawlq.ai, which will, it's like a content AI copywriter. So turn it in, can't compete. It'll just copy and paste whatever content you want and they'll rewrite it. So it's no longer played dress. Uh, neural text is another great tool to create large form documents like chapters and books. We're looking at social media for the social media people out there. Uh, Q, Q, that's a Q U U U. Uh, will actually find articles online that match your brand and will automatically post based on the time of your interaction within Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, it can also write articles for you and then post it as well. Missing Letter does the very similar, but takes it one step farther. And if you had articles on your website that you've posted, you can tell it to look at those articles and generate a, what's called a drip campaign in the social media world. Uh, so drip campaign will, will retweet or repost a article over and over again over a set period of time. And by choosing different quotes, it then reposts it. And so what it does is it looks at quotes within your paper or resummarizes it in such a way to make that, make that post look different to help draw awareness to that article that's on your website. And so that's missing letter without the E. Uh, Okaya is probably one of my favorite social media tools. Uh, this will automatically write tweets, posts, Facebooks, TikToks, et cetera, and schedule those out to be automatically sent out. So you don't have to actually post anything and you can let AI do it all. Uh, and these are some of the tools that I've been using over the years um, for content because I don't like social media too much. Uh, and I'd rather not be on it, so I use AI to do most of my posting. Uh, if you're looking at uh, building your brand up, uh, it's not socially acceptable to use bots to increase your uh, view usage in Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, usually block those apps from working. What Instu does is a little different. It uses the algorithms in place to for virality. Uh, and so it will like posts and then unlike posts. So it sees these interactions to help boost your, your reputation on those various platforms. The loophole in the world, but Insta. It also works on Tinder. However, that means use it as you go. <laughs> uh, image editing has been another huge component of AI, creating images and text, or even just uh, doing it as an image editor. Uh, so Bool Tool is probably one of like, like my favorite, like very inexpensive tools to use to edit photos. So you can highlight objects you want it to be removed, you can have it uh, enhance other objects, et cetera. Uh, Adobe Firefly creates like really cool little artistic renditions of things just by asking it to generate. Uh, 
there's a bunch, and so a lot of these tools that I've chatted about, I put them all on a single web page so you can click and play. Uh, I do have access to all these tools as well. So if you'd like access to any of these tools, or at least most of them, I can give you a username and password that you can sign in and play. Just send me an email and I will set you up. And here's some more. So if you go to links.evolveproject.org slash AI tools, you'll see this beautiful PDF of everything on there. If you're like me and you don't like paying for things, uh, I built my own AI tool that uses OpenAI's API. And so you want, if you, instead of paying 20 bucks a month, I'm giving it away for free right now because I don't care. Um, <laughs> you can use the, you can use the APIs from OpenAI and actually have access to ChatGPT4 uh, as, and just pound away at the API key. Uh, and it's still cheaper than $20 a month for me to run it for multiple people. Uh, so that's like the, the price discrepancy between everything, just so you're aware. It's very inexpensive to run uh, 3.5. 4 is a little bit more expensive because it requires more GPU power to provide content generation. But 3.5 is really, really cheap and inexpensive. Well, it's good that you mentioned that because that was a question that came out. Somebody was, it was asking with all these different <laughs> resources and services you were mm -hmm. have been talking about, what is the cost to use them? Do they have... Like yeah, most of, them are, most of them are set costs and not variable costs, which are nice. Um, so then you can use as much as you want and not worry about being a charge over it. Um, the social media tools range anywhere from like 10 to 35 bucks, uh, around the same cost of Hootsuite back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, image content creation is usually done by credits. And so it would give you X amount of credits for 10 or 20 bucks a month, uh, a single image will take anywhere from three to five credits depending on the company um, and the way they're, they're associating credits is api calls to open ai or stable diffusion depending on which product line they're using uh, so we have 10 more minutes and i will wrap up with a couple little helpful slides and really quick like discussion points um, challenges are within ai education uh, at a very, very high level, there's conversations about, do we allow the use of like chat GPT in a classroom? Yes or no. And it seems, in my opinion, the best solution is not to prevent the usage of it because you never will be able to. Um, but instead ask questions such as, hey, use chat GPT to write your article and then fact check it and find out what was true or where it found the source. That's a way different type of exercise. Um, another component that someone mentioned once in a, in a workshop was, uh, asking more feeling-based discussions. So instead of doing factual-based discussions, do how does this make you feel in your world or in your life? And it's very easy to read that to find out what was true or what's written by an AI. An AI can't give life experiences uh, unless you tell it to make one up. Uh, then there's a concept called AI generative inbreeding. Uh, what that means is AI has been creating so much content lately. AI, like those early on detectors that can detect if an AI wrote a piece of content or not, no longer are relevant because there's so much data out there that AI has now generated. If it looks at both and it assumes that the AI generated one is legitimate, it cannot make that comparison anymore. And it's gotten so bad that like chat GPT, some of the math questions it used to answer pretty well are wrong because it's getting too much information uh, in the ecosphere. <laughs> um, or it can't detect the difference between AI content creation versus something that's, that's original. I think the example was like a Shakespeare piece. I thought that a Shakespeare's piece, a very well-known one, was AI-generated content because it was posted on AI-generated content through websites and it made the wrong correlation. And the last challenge that people talk about is how does it pull content? Like what sources is it using? So I always say, tell people the best way to build your own AI is to choose and teach the AI to look at specific content sources, usually on your own like knowledge base or your, know, or your own infrastructure to look at very specific documents to use that as a determining factor and using OpenAI's API as an example to do the conversational piece. So it knows exactly where to pull the content from. You have that conversational dialogue and it only looks at its content versus the content within its own ecosphere. And then here's some awesome resources that Amanda has put together as well. And I'll let you talk about it for a few minutes, Amanda, so I catch my voice. That is fair enough. <clears throat> so, and I'll also mention to everyone who, if, if you weren't here at the beginning, um, if you have any questions that you want to um, have anything more explained or exp exp uh, 
you know, elaborate on more or anything you didn't hear about that you want to know more about, type it in the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. And these slides that Brian has been using will be available afterwards um, when we post up the archive. So all these links and everything you had in here, you'll all have access to that afterwards. Sweet. So looking at the links here, I'm going to make a 99% certain guess which ones they are. So <laughs> the bottom one is the I track tech gadgets. Most of them I actually just copy from what Brian's already been tracking. So shh, don't tell. <laughs> and so I put together like a little chart that shows different AI gadgets that you can get to use in your own library or your classroom and it's in different budget ranges. So that Kai's clan and the Zoomy thing, those all show up on that little guide. So if you have absolutely zero budget and you are still looking to introduce AI to your community, you can use that little chart. And incidentally, if you're a library in Nebraska, you can also check out a lot of that stuff through the tech kits or the mail. So I have little classroom packs of up to 15 copies of each different type of kit or robot available. And you can either check out a few of them, check out all of them, and you can use them for your programming or, or try it before you buy it. People use it in different ways. I don't care how you use it. And so that is that bottom link. And then the top link is the little summary pages about what AI is, different types of AI stuff, and some different like communities where you can go to. So for example, if you did a programming event to introduce Zoomy and AI to a bunch of your teenagers, then those same teenagers can go to that top resource and find out, okay, I want to learn more. I know that I can't go ask my librarian because she's going to look at me with wide scared eyes. So I'm going to go over to the to this learning community and I'll ask all my questions there. And then I'm going to go over to this um, resource page and I'll try out some more activities because I want to dig deeper into this. So that's what that's all about. Thanks, Amanda. All right. <clears throat> so we are at time. We've got five minutes left. Uh, I haven't, if there's questions, feel free to post them in the chat. If there's questions, if because you're watching the recording, my email address is there. Feel free to email. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you for attending. Yeah, awesome. Um, hey, go ahead and leave that slide up there. Yeah, while we're wrapping things up. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Brian and Amanda, for. Um, explaining all of this to to people it's i think it's a lot <laughs> uh to learn about everything but i think it's great we got a lot of these you know basic information and uh the resources i think is the key i think for a lot of people um if anybody does have any other questions go ahead and type in the questions section we can ask anything you have um out there or if you're just um overwhelmed by all the ai <laughs> that's it that's is a lot of stuff yes yes but it's, it's, but a it's big, shiny it's, and it's awesome. awesome. And I think it's an important topic that a lot of people have been talking about and um, confused about, not understanding what is it, what do I need to be worried about, um, is it something I need to be worried about. Um, but I think even though it is a Pandora's box, there's there's good things in there too that we can use them for, use it for, um, in the right way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then as a shameless plug, uh, computers and libraries, uh, the magazine. Uh, for the October issue has an article I put together about looking at like tech trends and how to pinpoint like what products to use. And I have some of these products explained as well um, within that article. So if you are subscribed, you'll have a really cool article to read. Uh, next month. And I'm in the September issue. I was going to say, is that the oh, same one as yours? No, yours is that because we just, yeah, yeah, I just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then sometimes some of the articles, not Amanda's unfortunately right now, but are available um, from the Computers and Libraries magazine on their website. Some of them, they you know, they pick a few of them to uh, be make available for anyone. Just click on the links for the HTML version of it. Uh, so depending on the article, you might be able to get it without having to um, be a subscriber or receive the magazine. Yeah. But it depends, yeah. All right, well, I don't see any other uh, questions coming in right now so i think we may be uh good for the day if nobody has anything desperate you want to ask of uh 
Brian or Amanda, before we wrap things up, um, get it into your question section there. And I will um, do my wrap up while I'm waiting to see um, if anybody does have anything they want to ask, anything you want to know more about, something about AI you were hoping to learn today that hasn't been covered yet. Uh, or if you want to share which cat you are. She yeah. has like the wide eyes right now. Are you right. just kind of relaxed, comfortable? Are you like, eh, whatever. <laughs> it's too much to deal with right now. <laughs> um, I think I, there's like, got to be a middle of the road cat too. Of um, like, I'm really interested, but I don't know if I have the the brain power, the energy right now to dig into it. But I'm gonna keep it on my radar, and we'll see. <laughs> That'd be great. Um. Let's see, we do have uh, here's a, oh, a comment, I, I, I guess. Um, someone's saying here, most recommendations for workers up against AI, up against AI taking their jobs, are to, quote, make yourself more marketable that individual focus. Rarely are there suggestions or support for workers to make sure AI implementation benefits everyone. You're not wrong. Mm -hmm. That's true. It doesn't have to be an either or. They can work with for their own. Yeah. There's a book that you might like called AI for AIQ or the New Geography of Jobs. If you're curious about how AI is changing the workforce and how AI can be used to make sure everyone has a good job instead of life sucking for some and being awesome for others. Mm -hmm. I call it the suckitude quotient, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> no, that sounds appropriate and, and me, yeah. yeah. All right, and then we just said some thank yous coming in. Thank you, Brian, Krista, and Amanda. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so I think I'll do um, my wrap up here. If you do all have any other questions, like you said, um, Brian's and contact info is out there. You also all know where to access, uh, contact Amanda. Um, and as I said, the slides will be available when I get the recording up. Um, the recording should be done and ready by the end of the day tomorrow. Yeah, um, usually takes about a day or so um, for GoToWebinar and YouTube to process everything. Um, this is our session page for today, but I'm going to pop over to the main Encompass Live page. Here's our upcoming shows, and then here's the link to our archives. Today's show, the most recent one, will be at the top of the page. And there's the one for that Kai's Education, if you want to watch oh. that one. Thank you. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is available. Uh, we'll push it onto our social medias as well. We have a a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We do reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Reminders about other things going on, introducing our presenters. Um, so you can see, um, follow us over there. We also use the hashtag Encump Live, a little abbreviation for our show name on Twitter and um, like Instagram. Our, our people put things out on there. So you, you'll get, you'll I'll announce there as well when the recording is available. Um, on the recording page here, I'll show you, there is a search feature if you wanted to see what we've done before. So for example, you could look up Brian's name and see all the other things he's done for us over the years. <laughs> um, Whoa, 2012. Yeah, we've been around for a long time. <laughs> um, and like I said earlier, well, before we went live, the show, um, this is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live first premiered in January, 2009. Uh, so do pay attention if you are watching a recording to the original broadcast date. They're all dated when they were first were, were done. Um, some of the shows will be fine and stand the test of time, be perfectly use, useful and everything. But some things will um, become older, outdated. Resources and information may become um, no longer be available anymore. Links may be broken. People may work completely at a different library than they worked at before when they presented for us. Um, so just pay attention to that when you're watching this. But um, as librarians do, we do keep things for historical purposes. And as long as we have a place to host all of our recordings, which right now is our YouTube channel, we will have them always out there available for you. So just pay attention when you are watching any of our um, recordings. Um, Oh, and Amanda said her email for Amanda is amanda.sweet at nebraska.gov. Here at the Library Commission. 
Um, Something else I want to, um, these are upcoming shows, but I wanted to, uh, that I just announced this morning. Uh, another online event we I host here is the Big Talk from Small Libraries online conference. It's a national conference, not just something Nebraska focused, um, where we have presenters from small libraries. All of our presenters are from libraries with an FTE or population served of 10,000 or less. And this morning, I opened up the call for speakers for the 2024 conference. So if you are, um, you can see all of our previous conferences. We've been doing this since 2012. I think it's the first one, yes. Um, so if you are at a small library uh, and, and or rural library, I would like to present. If something cool you want to share, submit a proposal to me. Um, deadline is December 15th to submit the proposals. And Big Talk is always on the last Friday of February. Um, so this next year, it is Friday, February 23rd is when it will be held. It's all online. You don't have to travel to Nebraska in the winter time. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> you just log onto your computer and present. So um, I've pushed this out on all of our various and, and pages. Uh, Big Talk also has a Facebook page and a Twitter account where you'll find that information as well. So um, if you um, so spread the word, please either submit a proposal or spread the word about Big Talk. Where did this year go? It feels like you just had Big Talk too. <laughs> you know? It does. It just creeps up. That's why I have notes in my calendar that pop up and say, "Hey, do this now." <laughs> before right. you. And also talking about 2024, next week our Encompass Live will, about, will be about our Library Commission grants that are going to be opening up for applications this Friday. Um, this is a Nebraska specific session, of course. This is grants for Nebraska um, libraries. We have our four grants we'll be opening for applications, CE and continuing education grants, internship grants, library improvement, and youth grants for excellence. And next week, myself, Sally Snyder, and Holly Duggan, we'll all be talking about the various grants that we run and giving you some more details about them. Um, the applications will open this Friday, Encompass Live is next Wednesday, and they'll be due November 17th. Um, for anything you're doing in 2024 as a Nebraska library. So if you are in Nebraska and you want to see if we can uh, give you some money for something cool you want to do, watch that. Um, and look at our other sessions. We've got some things filling in here. We've got more um, people I'm talking to to get specific topics on. So keep an eye on our schedule for any other um, shows that come that I get confirmed and on here. All right. Anybody have any last minute desperate questions they want to ask? Get it in right now. This is your last chance. Or anything, um, last words of wisdom um, from you, Brian or Amanda? AI, yeah, we're all going to die. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Brian? No, nope, that's it. Thanks for having me, everyone. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you all at a future episode of Encompass Live. Well, take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.